Hope you're not too full, full after the lunch. Um, I'll try to keep it interesting. I'm going to talk about a, our experience of putting together a postgraduate, you call it graduate program over here, I think we call it postgraduate program, which leads to a master's degree in data analytics, and it's running for three years. And um, yeah, I'm just really going to talk about how it all emerged and how we came up with uh, putting it together and um, some stats as well and, and our lessons learned. Um, so yeah, here I just talked about uh, that and the environment that we teach it because it's a fully distance and fully online program. So um, there are students that have never stepped foot into our institute and also there are students who never set foot into Ireland uh, and still emerged on the other side with a master's degree. It all started off with um, a serious industry demand for, um, for, for almost postgraduate rather than undergraduate um, um, students um, that they can feed into their uh, existing need or that they can work with their existing need in data analytics. Eight out of 10 of the main internet businesses like Twitter, Google, Facebook have their European headquarters in, in Ireland, which really means Dublin, because it's, it's quite small. So we had a direct need from industry to work with that. Um, we, also wanted to, um, we also wanted to produce a program that, that focused on flexible learning in, in up to a point. Well, initially we didn't know that we would go fully distance learning, because we weren't sure whether our provost would agree to that, um, especially the fact that students never sit an exam, never come to uh, the, the campus at all. But this worked out uh, quite nice, and I'll come back to this later on. Um, it's a part-time program, so students um, that we have or had in the last three years are uh, generally professionals that work with companies like IBM, large telecommunication companies, Intel, Ericsson's, um, and so on. And we wanted to have an applied program rather than uh, one that was just purely driven by by theory, and again, I explain when I talk about the structure of the program, I'm going to talk more about this as well. The Institute of Technology Blanchardstown is actually just in the suburbs of Dublin, um, maybe six, seven miles outside the center. Um, really small institute. It's one of the smallest, I think it's the second smallest institute of technology. It only has two schools uh, with four different faculties. Um, Within the Department of Informatics, we have uh, two main areas. One is computer forensics and one is data analytics. And the master's program sits in data analytics and works a little bit with the computer forensics um, master's and degree, but um, not, not a huge amount. And we have about 800 students, so it's relatively small, and it's a government-funded um, institution. The program itself is called MSc in Business Intelligence and Data Mining. It uh, was ind independently validated in 2009 and then started first time to run in 2010. So we um, have now our fourth intake. Uh, it takes two full years to complete. Um, it is, as I said, fully online. Um, I'll talk about the environment that we use in, in a second. Uh, it only has an annual intake of 20 students. Uh, so it's heavily oversubscribed by now. Um, we had 40 odd students on the waiting list. But because it's a government-based institute, they decided not to um, take the couple of hundred thousand euro. Um, and we're still just using 20 students. Uh, there's restrictions with regard to um, resources, mainly staff. Um, so there, there are issues there, um, which maybe will be resolved. But at the moment, we have 20, 20 students. Um, the entry requirements are reasonably loose. So although it's in a department of informatics, um, and most students are from computer science IT background. We had architects, uh, engineers, electronic as well as mechanical. Um, and I, I list a few later on um, again. The cost is relatively cheap, uh, especially for, I suppose, US and Canada with 6,750, not per credit, but for the entire program. So, um, <laughs> so it's quite attractive. We do not differentiate between um, between national students and international students. So they're just all seen as, as students. I don't know whether this will change or not. Again, we as academics, I suppose, have very little to do with that. The structure of the program um, was developed solely for the purpose of this program. So none of these modules pre-existed. 
so we become classes. None of these classes pre-existed. None of the syllabi existed. We had two modules on an undergraduate level, uh, one on data mining and one on information retrieval and text processing. So we took bits and pieces and our experience, obviously, into developing the new syllabus. But as I said, it was solely developed for, for this program. Um, we have two modules per semester. Uh, so they're basically two evening sessions. Um, in the first semester, we have business intelligence, which looks at all business intelligence um, related aspects from uh, databases, data warehousing, um, ETL tools, um, right up to sort of predictive BI, uh, predictive driven BI uh, implementations, and we use a vast array of, of uh, software, all open source. Um, I'll, I'll maybe talk about the software later on, uh, maybe better, but it, for, for that module, really, I'll use open source tools. Um, the second module then that runs in parallel is data mining algorithms, where we really sort of um, look at all the different, or all, all the core algorithms um, from decision trees, rule-based learning, um, SVMs, and, and, and all the rest. Um, and it's probably the most, most theoretical module in there, um, in the sense that we, we, we do cover some maths in there. Um, but the students come out at the other end of this module with the knowledge how decision trees work and how SVMs work, not with the knowledge how to, for example, program them. So they know the advantages and disadvantages, uh, but they would not be able to, um, to, to implement them in Java or, or, or any other programming language. So we, we, get, we, you know, we pitch it at that level. Then in the second, uh, second semester, we focus on data exploration and pre-processing. Data exploration mainly with regard to visualization, and we also cover some statistics in there. And then pre-processing, again, focusing more on all the pre-processing um, steps involved in, in the predictive analytics scene. Then going into the um, second year, it starts off with a, a module called Business Intelligence and Data Mining Applications, which is a fully project-driven uh, module. So there's no, um, no classes as such. Each student has access, one-to-one -one access to a supervisor. And um, if, it's, um, if, it's data mine, if it's a data mining module, actually so far no one has picked a BI, mod a BI project, they're all data mining modules. It's really a, um, a project that, that follows a methodology, maybe the Chris DM methodology from start to finish, uh, from um, getting a data set. A lot of the students would use data sets that they have, at, uh, have access to at, at their workplace and um, create a, an objective and then follow through in fitting in a, a predictive or several predictive models or descriptive models uh, onto that. Um, really beneficial module because they, you know, they have enough time then to get their hands dirty rather than just jumping from one topic to the next. Um, and we get, yeah, I'll talk later on about the outcome of this as well. And uh, in, um, then we have uh, two electives in the third semester. Um, we have text mining and web content mining, which has, um, has been offered all the time. Um, multimedia mining has never ran, actually, because the, the person who wrote the syllabus and the person who um, uh, is on a secondment, he works on a research project, and GIS mining um, then ran as well. Each of these modules are 10 credits. It follows a European credit system. And the master's in total has 90 credits, and the remaining 30 credits is made up of the master's thesis that they write um, in, the, um, in the fourth semester. And so they start in, Jan in January, generally, and then submit. Uh, well, they can submit in, in June, but most of the time they take a bit longer, and they submit then in August. What we use to deliver the uh, the, the modules in our fully online mode is Adobe Connect, uh, which is a virtual classroom software. I don't know whether many of you are familiar with it, but it's just, an, you know, just a virtual classroom. There's many other tools out there as well. It works really, really well. There's the odd hiccup um, um, with it, but you know, maybe that's more related to the infrastructure it's located in. And um, 
ideally, I think it would be probably if Adobe hosts it, but there's politics involved that it needs to be hosted within the college. So, um, yeah, it, it works reasonably well. Um, it has all the, the usual things, voice over IP, uh, chat, like a, a text chat, polling, whiteboards, file sharing, um, uh, video, screen sharing. Um, breakout rooms are really nice as well if you want to introduce some group work. Uh, you can create breakout rooms and add students, maybe four or five students into individual breakout rooms. And um, they can do some group work. And that works reasonably well as well. And obviously, most importantly, we can record uh, all our uh, sessions, and they will be uh, made available after um, in our virtual learning environment, which is Moodle. Most of you are probably familiar with Moodle. Um, it is a VLE, just like Blackboard or WebCT or whatever else is out there. Um, we have communication forums that are really heavily used because obviously students do not meet. They're missing that contact of um, maybe bouncing ideas back and forth or uh, trying to troubleshoot problems um, together. So the communication forums is, is, is really heavily um, used. Um, we offer then file downloads, um, like just the usual PowerPoint presentations, um, lab files, solutions to problems, um, and so on. Uh, also, assessments are submitted through Moodle. Um, as I said, we don't have any exam as part of the program, so everything is uh, continuously assessed through papers. I'll talk about this a bit more. Um, and they're submitted through Moodle, and they're, um, we use Turnitin. It's a plagiarism prevention service uh, where students get the option to pre-submit and see their, it's called a similarity index. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Turnitin, probably most of you by, by now. And uh, it simply highlights sections that it believes to be plagiarized. And um, we obviously have to be very um, strict with that, especially given that the students are not uh, on campus. OK, our students, as I said earlier, we have really small intake of just 20 students per year. At the moment, and this is just because there's a, it's a new concept of having fully distance learning. And generally, um, we, we wouldn't necessarily have the oversubscription of programs. So we have, on the undergraduate level, we have better option or better opportunities to grow. At the moment, this is first come, first serve. And we, we try to change that over to really pick the top 20, because it, it really would make sense it, to just pick 20 out of, uh, the best 20 out of um, 60 or 80 applications. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Typically, they have degrees in computing and IT, but we also have other ones like um, engineering, architecture, pharmacy, forestry, management, and so on. And our, our only requirement, entry requirement, with regard to that is that they have um, a numerate, uh, numerate background. From my experience, or from our experience, it's really interesting um, that, for example, the architect, he looked at problems completely differently to computer science, you know, because we just see square boxes, and he just, he just looked at different things. And um, he, um, he worked, for a lot of the projects, he worked more on the visualization side and came up with really, really cool stuff as well, and published a lot in that as well. Um, yeah. There's also a small percentage that already had a master's degree, uh, and um, two had a PhD qualification, but uh, one in chemistry and one in physics. So they just wanted to, they already worked in the area and they wanted to change over. Um, many students already work in data analysis, um, generally more sort of on the database and data warehousing side, more so than on the um, data mining predictive analytics side or BI side. They're highly motivated. They're between 30 and 50. They know exactly what they want. Um, they also, um, you know, when they're working five hours, they're working five hours on the product, on the project. So it's not like undergraduate students that are distracted with all the social networking things or any any of the other bits. So the outcome is is amazing. You know, we I'll talk later on about it, but we get we get submissions of 220 pages for their master's thesis, where you really find it hard to to cut anything out of it because it's just it's just really, really good stuff. 50% um, of the students live within reach of ITB, so maybe 10 miles, 15 miles. 25% um, then live um, outside in other counties where it would not be feasible to drive or commute um, regularly to it. And then 25% are from other countries, US, Canada, Jamaica, 
um, UK, Germany, Holland, Singapore. Um, so we had a good, good range of, uh, of, of students from all over the world. Um, also, what I, I don't think I mentioned that in any other slide. We also have students from Dublin, but they work for consultancies like Accenture, so they would, they would really um, travel a lot. Uh, there was one student in, I think, in our second intake. He never tuned in on the same city twice, so he's just traveling around. And obviously, he wouldn't be able to do the course without it, without the, the online component of it. 60% um, of all the students attend at least 80% of our live sessions, um, so they don't necessarily focus just on the, on the re recordings. <coughs> and the foreign students focus more on the recordings because obviously there's a time difference, um, um, especially then to further field countries like, um, I suppose, outside Europe. Um, yeah. Type of access um, or access of type of learning objects. Um, you know, interesting, the recordings are one quarter. Additional resources are um, more um, application associated files, maybe solution um, files or models. And the time of allocation uh, for access as well uh, is quite interesting because a lot of students seem to access it during work, working hours obviously try to get a bit of um, reading time and, uh, and work done during, um, during their working hours. And then obviously we, we, you know, we have some um, other access times as well. Um, the student assessment then, which is hugely important, and we always focus really on that, simply because, again, we don't have that, um, that final end of term exam where students come in and, uh, and, and sit in a written exam that we can grade then, and we also know that this is in fact the student that um, sits this exam. Um, we generally have three main assessments per module. Um, there could be literature reviews, practical papers, practical reports. We have self-assessment components in there, peer evaluation uh, components, um, online and offline presentations. Offline presentations would be presentations uh, they record. Um, Jing is a really nice application for that because it's limited to five minutes, so they can just give a five-minute presentation on what they've, what they've worked on, um, and then the dissertation of it as well. So it's quite, it, it's quite labor-intensive, of course. Um, the, the papers are generally in the region of 3,000 or 3,000 words, so they're just regular academic papers, maybe six, seven, eight, nine uh, pages. Um, the reports may be a bit longer because they contain more screenshots. Um, as I said, our students are really um, very motivated. They're very driven as well. These are some papers that led to publications, um, communities in crime, uh, where we use predictive modeling. Premiership football match results worked reasonably well. It outperformed a um, um, Mark Lawrence as a, as a UK pundit and it outperformed him with his predictions. Um, but I never put any money on, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it worked reasonably well, and the techniques we used from a visualization point of view were, were quite novel. Um, yeah, so there's a good number of aspects. This was actually a, a police officer. He looked at um, comments left on ecstasy uh, tablet forum pages, and we've done some k-means clustering and uh, some classification. Um, Sentiment analysis of U.S. presidential election was really interesting as well in terms of how neutral uh, um, newspapers actually are using uh, text analysis. So um, just to give you some, some examples. Thesis topics then, they range from some papers being really theory, focused on, on theory, like um, looking at SIP's law sort of um, novel approaches. Others are much more, a lot more applied when they take some of the data set that they have at work and access to at work um, and, and work with it. And some of the, some of the results are, are really, really uh, good. They implemented as well as well. The telecommunication one was implemented at a large um, telecommunication company in, in Ireland. Um, the last one here, using data mining to reduce fuel bill of a major international airline, led to a saving of $50 million per year. And that was, that was really impressive. So I didn't get any of that, but she made a, she got a good, she got a good uh, promotion with it. Um, so it's, it's, I suppose from our experience, it's really nice to see 
that uh, working with professionals that you know they can change something within the company as well and uh, the company um, appreciates that as well reflections and lessons learned the online classroom works surprisingly well um, it's a bit weird I don't know whether how many of you have given online lectures yeah so it is weird just talking to um, to the screen and uh, they can't see they can't see me you only see that so you can put the feed up um, maybe if you want but it's uh, it's certainly different what I suppose what's the strangest thing is that you you know you don't see faces you can't have a bit of banter you can't you, know, you can't even make a joke because you don't know whether anyone is laughing or not um, you don't even know whether they are that they are or not Yeah, they do have headsets, but um, if you have them all switched on, then it's just getting a bit too messy. So we usually don't have them switched on. Um, so yeah. Mm. Yeah, we, we do that. So if, if anyone wants to ask a question, we, we have that. But still, it's, uh, it is certainly a, a stranger environment to teach, and it takes a little bit of time to get used to it. Um, I like it by now, but it, it certainly took, took a while to, to just get used to it. Also. If you prepare material for a class, maybe that usually takes two hours to deliver. Online, it doesn't. It takes maybe an hour 15. So you fly through much quicker because, again, you don't have interruptions as such. Um, and you can manage interruptions better because you know, they usually, well, in our case, they're submitted using the chat tool. As you can select when you want to answer them. So by then, you maybe have already answered some other questions. So it, it is certainly different. Um, OK, the software, I haven't really talked much about it. Um, when we started it, we had a big problem with software because, um, well, any off-the-shelf tools, from a licensing point of view, we had huge problems because we couldn't. Uh, we had no control over any of the machines that students use. Um, and um, therefore, there were licensing issues with it. IBM now brought out MAP, which is the academic program, uh, which helps a little bit. There's still a small print that says you should, in theory, be in charge of the machine that the student is using. So maybe virtualization is, is one. Um, um, I spoke to David earlier. Maybe that's one way of, um, of uh, overcoming that. But there are really good uh, open source tools around as well. RapidMiner, I don't know whether you know RapidMiner. It's an open source tool developed by a German company. Uh, very powerful, very similar to uh, SPS Modeler. Uh, brings huge amount of advantages using open source tools because um, especially from a computer science point of view, um, you can change code. You can get students as their projects to implement um, novel implementations of algorithms. On top of it as well, you don't have just one support vector machine available. You have three or four or five. Um, some are quite novel. They're maybe just novel implementations from research papers. Um, R has, I think, close to 5,000 packages that are all directly connected to data analysis. Um, so really, really powerful, uh, very nice uh, visualization tools are out there as well. The disadvantage of these tools sometimes is that the coherent thought isn't there. Um, like the clustering implementation in RapidMiner is not as nicely done as in SPSS Modeler, for example. So you do have, uh, you do have the drawbacks. Also, uh, there still is a difference whether someone puts in their experience in RapidMiner as to they have experience in SPSS Modeler or SAS. Enterprise minor. Um, on, in reality, I don't think it really matters. Uh, we have students from IBM, and they don't use Rapid Minor, but they use it for the purpose of our course. But once they go into the more uh, free assignments, they use SPS up modelers, and they, they just you know, they, they just said the the, um, uh, the changeover is really straightforward because it all mattered about the concepts. So if you know how cross validation works or um, how parameter optimization works, you just have to find a way to do that in in the other software. So I, I don't think it's, it's a big issue. Um, yeah, so open source tools offer flexibility, but sometimes limited um, in their capability or completeness. Um, also, it's really difficult to cover everything. I know we produced a program that just focus on, focuses on data mining and a bit of BI. But um, the, the big problem now is that if we want to introduce big data into it, something has to give. So it's, it's quite difficult um, to know, uh, and also very difficult to teach everything. Um, yeah, the MC is focusing more on data mining applications rather than deep theory. 
which I, again, I think it, the level we pitch it is really, really nice and works quite well. Um, again, we have a high level of ability and high level of motivated uh, students, which makes it really joyful to teach in comparison to some of the undergraduate programs. Um, it, it, it's really, really good. Uh, now, uh, at the same time, they're, um, they're really challenging. They want, um, they want you to get back to them more or less straight away. And uh, so the workload is, is, is quite significant. And yeah, most students after their uh, work have progressed horizontally or vertically within their company or other companies. And uh, the feedback is really outstanding. So that concludes my presentation.